Thank you for joining us at uh, Beer Fish Fanatics. And this episode is actually brought to you by Whisker Seeker Tackle. So make sure you guys go to whiskerseeker.com for all your catfishing gear. Enjoy the episode, guys. I had to finish that one off, sir. We 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 actually did a little recording right before you you jumped on, Mark. We were doing some some beer taste testing. So, oh, that's, uh, delicious. <laughs> all right, guys, welcome to another episode of Beer Fish Fanatics. This is Grandy on my pop fishing. We have uh, Kit greasy Kit with no AC right now. That's why I'm all super greasy. My AC doesn't work, but uh, yeah, with the Fishing Kit YouTube channel. <laughs> and just keep, give everybody a heads up because we have people all over the world listening to us. It's over 90 degrees today and it was pretty darn humid. So uh, I feel for you, Kit, man. Sorry, man. <laughs> I'll be hiding out in the basement after this. <laughs> Today, we, uh, in our presence, you know, as we, we mentioned earlier in all of our podcasts, we love having the Iowa DNR uh, really be a, a staple and a part of our, our podcast and our show and everything. So today, by popular demand, we have from the Iowa DNR, Mr. Mark Fleming joining us, and he's a fishery biologist. Is that correct, sir? Yes. Yep. I'm a fisheries management biologist for South Central and Southeast Iowa. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. And today, quick shout out to our sponsor, Kelowna Brewing Company. Today, I'm drinking the Tree Stand. I'm doing, it's a Pilsner Lager light beer here. Uh, I think it's, it's yep, 4.9 uh, alcohol content on this one. So taking it a little bit light, not too, too light, um, but it's, uh, I'm going to try this one out. What do you got, Kit? I, uh, this is probably like the third one in a row, but um, Kelowna Classic. It's a light beer, man. I, like I said, my AC8 ain't working, so I'm not trying to drink a big, heavy beer. I just got to take it easy. <laughs> All right. Cheers, cheers, guys. Well, cheers. That is not bad at all, Kip. I don't know. Have you tried the tree stand? Make sure you try that, man. It's pretty good. I'll get you some. I'll okay. see if, yeah, i get you some if you haven't had it. But it's pretty good, man. It's, uh, it's, it's got good body. It's crisp. Not too hoppy, so I don't know. Are you a hop head or anything at all, Mark? No, I don't like IPAs. So, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm good. Well, then you need to try one of these next time. I'll, I'll see if I can get you some. So it's called the Tree Stand from Kelowna Brewery Company, or actually try their Kelowna Light, that, the one that uh, Fishing Kit has here. Try that. I, I kid you not. I keep telling anybody who loves, like, the domestic light beers, if you give that one a shot, you guys would truly understand how good of a beer that is. Yeah, okay. Easy drinking. Yeah, if you're into like Bud Light or Coors Light, Bush Light, Miller Light, all the light beers, Kelowna Classics, the one. There you go. So let's get into the fishing because I, you know, I have, I know there's a billion questions that I want to ask. I know a billion questions for, uh, fishing kid wants to ask. A lot of people, you know, love it when we have you guys on. Uh, if you don't mind, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about you, yourself, and, and, and what do you, you know, what are you doing for the Iowa DNR? You bet. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a Northwest Iowa native. I grew up in the Lamars area, the big town of Merrill, Iowa, but uh, I grew up fishing every single day that I could. I had a grandfather. I was fortunate enough to spend time trouncing around, catching bullheads all over the place. Um, decided that that sounded like the coolest job in the world and kind of followed up and, and went on to college uh, in Missouri and later on at South Dakota State. And uh, Worked in Texas as a fisheries biologist for a little bit, came back to Iowa 26 years ago, and I've been back, I've been down at Rathlin ever since. Uh, love my job, the best job in the world, the uh, best job I ever had, I guess you'd say, and, and uh, um, work in, in all kinds of amazing systems in South, South Central and Southeast Iowa, and, and get to do a whole lot of other things that you wouldn't even necessarily think of as as a, a you know something a fishery biologist would do but but um, and, and then I'm a I'm an avid avid angler um I, I spend a lot of time walleye fishing but uh, probably my my biggest go-to species is a uh, hybrid striped bass I chase them really hard. Uh, and I, as a matter of fact I, I fish for those uh, four out of the last five days so uh, it's 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 Great to be here with you guys, and, and let's talk some fish, fishing, and biology. Yeah, that, uh, that's funny. I'm, I'm going to talk about how how I uh, I guess how we all got connected because I was 
I'm on, I'm in these face Facebook fishing groups and, um, yeah, I saw your, one of your posts and you were going into all these details about the hybrid striped bass. I was like, this, this guy, there's, there's something about this guy. He knows a little bit more than, you know, meets the eye. Then I reached out to him like, Hey, you know, I kind of asked him, you know, what do you do? And uh, we do this podcasting, you know, it'd be great to have you on. And I mean, we tried a few times with, you know, despite our schedules not matching up or whatever, but we finally got you on. So what is it about hybrid striped bass? I mean, I love them too. I got them in my little avatar right here. They're yeah, my favorite fish. Awesome. I need that. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, let's never call them wipers because wipers is something you would find in the bathroom and that drives me crazy when people call them. Okay. I'm going to have to go change all my videos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> But um, what is it that attracts me to them? <clears throat> you know, it's the, here's how I explain it to a buddy, a buddy of mine uh, about a week ago. It's the trophy fish that anybody can catch, you know? And, and I mean, the, the thing about it is there are some of us out there that spend a lot of time on them and, and really target them. But realistically, I have striped bass in Iowa is that fish that, is the fish of a lifetime that anyone can go out and, and really catch. I mean, you, you know, how many people can say, Hey, I caught a 28 inch walleye. Not a lot of us, but people who can say, uh, you know, Hey, I caught a, an eight pound hybrid striped bass. There there's, there's more of them. You know, I took my daughter out uh, Saturday before father's day. And it was the first time we'd had a, a chance to even fish together this year. She's a senior at Iowa state. And, uh, you know, we braved the heavy boat traffic and she caught two eight pound plus fish. Um, oh. And, and uh, you know, how, how often does that happen? Uh, right. So that's why I love hybrid striped bass. That and, you know, uh, the, my buddy of mine I was fishing with this week says, why would anybody fish for anything else? Well, obviously we, <laughs> we don't necessarily believe that, you know, we, we love to, we love to catch everything. Um, but it's, it's just the fast action and the fact that, you know, of the 40 fish I put in the boat this week, uh, maybe six of them were less than five pounds. So wow. there you go. All right. Well, yeah. offline, Mark, you might have to, um, give us a little <laughs> pointers in the right direction of where you were at. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll do it offline. <laughs> well, uh, All right. how, how, how about this? How about this? So. Let's just speak uh, in general terms. So if somebody wants to go out and target these hybrid striped bass, you know, what are some pointers that you could give to them as far as like techniques and uh, tackle to use? You know, the thing about it this week is it was the simplest things in the world were the things that worked the best. Um, and it was what my daughter, you know, my daughter is not a bait cast person. You know, she, I gave her a heavy spinning outfit and I put a, I put a, a, a five inch swim bait on it. And that was all it took. Mm -hmm. And honestly, um, that was the bait this week that was outperforming everything else. I throw a lot of a rigs, uh, and, and we had good luck with those this week, but honestly, a single swim bait was, was really kind of a go-to thing. I throw a lot of big giant flutter spoons, but that has not been producing for me this year. Mm. Um, whereas, uh, you know, just the simplest things have been. And so that's, that's the exciting thing is it's, it's, uh, it, it, it can be a different type of fishery every single year, every single day. Um, you know, I spent a lot of money over the winter on going with a live scope. And uh, I thought you know, that's going to help me target those hybrids. And it does. And, and I learned new stuff this week. Seeing a school of hybrid striped bass actually schooling on a live scope is bizarre. I mean, it's awesome. It's the coolest thing ever. Hmm. Have you ever caught one through the ice? Have I ever caught one through the ice? Um, yeah, I've caught some through the ice. And years ago, you know, I used to catch some white bass on, through the ice on Rathbun. Um, but there are some folks out there, uh, large reservoirs that are targeting hybrid striped bass um, through the ice and they're being highly successful, mm -hmm. um, you know, but that's, that's really not me. I like to ice fish, but I don't love to ice fish. <laughs> I, like, I like to be warm, 
And uh, so, um, you know, that's kind of an oxymoron when you're high school. So it's uh, <laughs> it's something that I do because, well, you know, there's no open water, so I might as well do something. But uh, as soon as the ice is off or even up to ice formation, you know, I love having the boat out. I, I would say I like ice fishing a little bit more than you, but I know exactly where you come from. You just love fishing and you cannot just sit all winter and not fish, can you? Yeah. Doesn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to go once a week as opposed to four times a week which is what i'm generally doing right now yeah <clears throat> so mark you, you've been uh with the iowa dnr for what over 20 odd years is that correct 26 years uh this fall so yeah awesome wow congratulations and then uh i think I, I saw you did win the uh, was the fishery biologist of the year for the Midwest, I believe. And was it 17, right? Something it was like some that. time ago. I guess I can't really remember. <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of a, you know, a, 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 an unexpected honor. And, and uh, um, I really appreciated that. It's, uh, um, you know, I've had a, a career that's allowed me to do a lot of really cool things. And I'm still going along, you know, and, and so it's, um, I, I, and I, I know I keep saying it, but I really do have the coolest job in the world because I get to go out, uh, and, and run nets, uh, right. you know, and, and sample channel catfish this week. Um, and then I sit down last night and I was writing a part of a textbook, uh, basically that's fisheries related. So, um, it's never the same job twice, but, you know, the point is I get to do a lot of really cool stuff. That's cool. Yeah, it, yeah, that's pretty cool. What would you say is like the, the biggest misconception uh, the general public would have about a fish? Because a fishery biologist, I mean, it, it's kind of is all over the place in a way in my mind, you know, for the normal human being that does, you know, is not as highly educated as, as many others are in the fishing world. But what, was, what would you say is like the biggest misconception uh, that people have about a fisher's biologist biggest misconception I, I guess the biggest misconception about fisheries in general is um that stocking fish is the most important thing to do don't get me wrong stocking fish is important okay and, and it's absolutely a tool that we need um you know if, without stocking fish we wouldn't have hybrid striped bass without stocking fish we wouldn't have most of our walleyes in the state um but the key to to sound fisheries management is habitat and what's the fish is habitat it's water and so working with the water is, is absolutely the most important thing that we do and i don't know that people would necessarily know that um you know we're honored to have a, a lake restoration program in the state of iowa that really allows us to target a lot of waters that need help need it you know kind of a kick in the short so to speak and and uh, it's been a highly popular highly successful program in the state and that's, I think, probably the biggest tool we have driving for better fish, uh, better fishing in, in the state of Iowa. So, so it's not just keep throwing in more uh, and more fish. <laughs> no, it's not. But you know what? I mean, that, that's certainly part of it. Um, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, I, I, my office is at the Rathen Fish Hatchery, and there's a lot of extremely important work that goes on there because, again, without the those fish hatcheries, we wouldn't have the walleye populations or the hybrids or the channel catfish. Basically, everything has to has you know a lot of these species do need to be stocked on, on a on a regular basis. And, you know, without the quality habitat, it doesn't matter how many fish you throw at a situation. You gotta you gotta have the quality habitat. That's job one. Oh, so I guess my question is like, so what's your average day to day like? Are you are you the guy like handling the fish or the guy well, out testing the water or? <laughs> so it, it it's very seasonally based. You know. Um, for instance, we can start out in, in late March and, and go through mid-April and we're working really hard on our walleye spawning season. That's kind of an all hands on deck thing in the state of Iowa. It's, uh, it, it, it isn't just the Rathen area. It's, it's Storm Lake, it's Spirit Lake, it's, it's Clear Lake. Uh, and, and that is the Fisheries Bureau's number one goal at that time is to collect the walleyes that we need to drive that stocking program for the state. And that's, that's basically a two or three week period where that is uh, pretty much everybody in our agency is, is working for that end. Uh, then for us uh, in, in our neck of the woods, 
um, you know, we, we shift to a bunch of other cool pro, uh, things. I've got a, a very important uh, project on shovel nose sturgeon um, that is, uh, includes both the Cedar and the Des Moines River system. Um, and the Des Moines River being in our management district, uh, working with uh, uh, some research biologists on that project. So we're uh, tagging shovel nose sturgeon. And then we're moving into our, our annual uh, lake sampling. And so uh, all the lakes in our district are sampled periodically, some more of than others, but that's the data collection that we use not only to tell anglers what's out there and what can you target, but really that's, um, that is the ongoing job of a fisheries biologist is to collect that data and determine, hey, is this a quality fishery? Can this fishery be improved? Do we need to do things like stock fish? Do we need to do things like improve water quality? Do we need to do things like uh, a set of different regulations? You know, regulation assessment is, is something that's always ongoing. It's, it's interesting to read Facebook posts and, and uh, you know, folks uh, say, well, you know, I want a walleye length limit at Rafton Lake. Why? You know, it's, it, it, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be. I'm not saying that there never will be. What I'm saying is, but why do you want the regulation? Because not all regulations fit every single lake. No two lakes are the same. You have to get that important data on those fish populations to figure out, hey, what what regulation is needed? It, well, first of all, is a regulation needed? If so, what regulation is needed? Uh, what works here is not going to work there. And so there's a lot of, a lot of information that needs to be gathered. Currently, uh, a regulation on walleyes at Rathbun Lake is not going to change the, the, the overall fishing. It's not going to move the needle, so to speak. So uh, we don't have a a special regulation on, on walleyes and Rathbun Lake. But again, that's part of my job to determine if and when that's going to be needed. Glad you mentioned the the social media thing because that that that's something that everybody sees. And you know, obviously social media has been so huge uh in the past what decade pretty much. Um, like you were just saying, you see so many people like, well, why don't they just set a regulation or set a limit, whether it's hybrid bass or like you just said, or or, or uh walleyes or what? I mean, what I mean, we touch base, I, I think, you know, Jeff Capasco, we, we touch base a little bit of what it takes to set these limits, but can you go into a little bit more detail? Like, okay, it's not as simple as like, okay, we're just going to set a limit tomorrow. That's it. You can only keep two, you know, hybrid bass that, you know, whatever size, yeah. that's it. What, what actually goes into it? And, and can you help explain to, cause a lot of our listeners are on the social media and that's why they, you know, they want these answers. It, there's basically three questions you have to answer about any population when you're considering a regulation. And, and that is answering three questions on, on what are known as dynamic rate functions or, or uh, uh, population dynamics. One, one I know about recruitment, growth, and mortality. Okay? Recruitment means how many fish are coming into the population on an annual basis. Stocking can play a role in that, but natural recruitment, if you're talking about large numbers, bass, bluegill, or crappie, um, stocking if you're talking about uh, hybrid straight bass or walleye or, or in many cases more than pike and things like that. Uh, recruit, so that's recruitment. How many are coming in? We have to get a handle on that and so we use our sampling data to do that. Growth, how fast are these fish growing? Um, and so we actually have to determine that. We take structures to determine how fast uh, hybrid straight bass and Lake Rathbun grow on an annual basis. Um, and then mortality. We need to have an estimate of, of how many fish are dying on an annual basis. A lot of that mortality is going to be natural mortality. Some of it is going to be harvest mortality. And you have to have a handle on both of them. So you take those three pieces of information uh, that we gather during our surveys and you evaluate that. You can use computers to evaluate that, and, and we do. Um, we use what we refer to as long-term data sets. In other words, uh, has this population been going up? Has it been going down? Has it been all over the place? Um, all this is important to determining, hey, do we need to set a regulation? Uh, do we need to drop a regulation? Do we need to change a regulation? Uh, and, and so that's, the, you know, it, it's, I won't say it's easy, but really those three pieces of information are what really drive uh, regulation assessment. I've written a few articles over the years, all the way back to grad school. And, and I think the key is people need to understand no two lakes are the same. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about Iowa or in the, the nation. 
Uh, sure, we have some some regulations that are similar among lakes, uh, but those three pieces of information I just mentioned to you are never the same in, in those three lakes. And so you have to balance um, the needs um, of, of uh, what the public is looking for. Um, you know, what does the public want and what can we realistically provide? You know, it's interesting on Rathbun Lake, this amount about that walleye population in the last 20 years, well, the last 30 years, really. Um, but uh, our focus has kind of changed from, a, um, you know, we, we realize that it takes a lot of stocking to drive that walleye fishery at Rathbun Lake. But one thing we haven't really known much about is fish escapement. And uh, flood water discharge of a flood control reservoir is a huge determiner of uh, walleye abundance in that particular system. Corps of Engineers has had to change the way they release water in the last decade, actually the last six or seven years, because um, there's a lot of concern about flooding uh, in, in, in terms of, of flood control reservoir management these, these days. And so um, it's more difficult to keep fish in a lake like Rathbun or uh, Sailorville or Red Rock or Coralville because the Corps of Engineers has, has had to move or kind of alter their management strategies and now they release a lot more water a lot faster than they used to. Uh, and these fish go with the flow. So the walleyes, the hybrid striped bass, they tend to want to escape. And, and so escapement is a huge determining factor of walleyes in Lake Rath. We're working on ways to reduce that loss. Um, we've got some really cool research we've done over the years, and I'm really excited about it. And before I retire, we're going to have uh, an electric barrier in Rathbun Lake to reduce walleye immigration, uh, because that is a huge, that is, that, that is the key you know, we've, we've got the stocking figured out. We've got the, the, you know, the regulation assessment we can do, but keeping the fish in the lake, that's, that's the key. We don't have a, a grip on right now. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of people, what they don't realize is that most of the walleyes in our state are stocked. That's correct. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. And that is so absolutely correct. So, even in many of our river systems, they're stocked in many of the Northeast rivers or the North Central rivers or the Central Iowa streams. Yeah, most of that is, is stock fisheries. Mississippi River, not so much, but but yeah, it's definitely a stock fi stocked fish just about everywhere you go in Iowa. Is there is there a reason why there isn't really much um, natural reproduction for the walleyes, at least in Iowa? <laughs> it yeah, well, keep in mind that most of our lakes south of uh, Blackhawk Lake in Sac County, uh, everything south of that is a man-made impoundment. And mm -hmm. those impoundments don't have a lot of variety of habitat. So they don't necessarily have a lot of quality habitat for walleye spawn. Even our more natural lakes um, probably don't have sufficient habitat um, you know, maybe they do to some degree, but not a, not sufficient habitat to meet the needs of our anglers in the state of Iowa. So it, it comes down to habitat, water quality, uh, and just sheer numbers. That's why we have to stop. Um, you know, if, if no one lived uh, in the Iowa Great Lakes, you know, there, there, maybe there would be enough walleye uh, produced naturally to have a good walleye population, but what would we care? You know, it's, we're not there to enjoy it. So we, we are there. We want to provide a quality fishery and some stocking is the key to getting is one of the keys to getting there. Okay. That's cool. That's pretty cool. So how did your, uh, just recent, uh, you're mentioning that you're, you're, you're doing some channel catfish netting and everything. How did that go? And what was that? Uh, I guess you say, what was that for? Were you just, just collecting data? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're out of the walleye evaluation. We're out of, you know, we're, we're too warm to sample most of our lakes now in terms of our largemouth bass or bluegill or crappies. So that, that sampling season's passed, but now we're in summer. So we're in our catfish sampling mode. Uh, we use hoop nets that are baited with soybean cake. Uh, they sit out for three days and that soybean cake gets kind of fermented. And so the catfish love that and they run to the nets. Now, why do we do that? Because catfish is a stock product. We need to determine, um, hey, are we stocking sufficient numbers? Are we stocking too many uh, fish? Uh, and uh, what's their growth and size quality like? You know, in many cases, we might have to reduce stocking 
to improve growth rates. You know, that years ago when we started sampling in this with this way, we found out that we had way too many catfish in some of these lakes. They weren't growing. They weren't going to reach a 20 inch size. Uh, and so we had to reduce stocking density. So that's where we're at right now. And then as fall comes along, we'll start uh, sampling more walleyes and, and uh, crappies again. And so uh, it's kind of an evolution depending on the season. But yeah, the, the catfish thing is, is always kind of fun. Um, I have, uh, you know, some seasonal employees working for us this year. And um, we have one who's a really strong young man. And thank goodness, because uh, I and uh, Bruce Ellis, the technician I work with, we're not as strong as we used to be. And, and we had nets that might have 300 pounds of fish in them. So we had this kid along to help us pull them in the other day. Um, you know, we used to, this is really not all that related uh, necessarily, but a few years ago, we did an evaluation to determine what bait works best to catch catfish. And we learned that rotten cheese works really well. But as a, as a, uh, a fisheries biologist and a human being, being around a 55 gallon drum of rotten cheese is really one of the most disgusting things I've ever had to do in my entire life. And so fortunately we found out we have other solutions. To that. Well, after this episode, we're going to see a bunch of people with rotten cheese on their line. Now <laughs> we used to go up to Wisconsin and buy these 55 gallon drums of cheese. And then they'd sit in the heat of our uh, storage building for a year and, one day we had one that was kind of wobbling and I looked at it and uh, looked at Bruce. And so he said, all right, I'll take the lid off and it exploded. And it was, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, yeah, I think the last time we spoke to Jeff, uh, that's when I found out a lot of our catfish are stocked too. That's what really threw me off guard. Like I knew the walleyes were stocked, the hybrids and stuff. And yeah, it, uh, that kind of surprised me with the catfish. Yeah, yeah. Channel catfish in our lake systems uh, are, are usually stocked. Um, the only time we get natural recruitment of channel catfish in most of our lakes is if those lakes have relatively poor water quality. In other words, they're, they're turbid or muddy looking most of the time. Um, part of that is that in a lot of lakes, um, catfish may reproduce in the spring, you know, or in the summer because, you know, you can oftentimes target them in late May or early June, right up in the rocks along the dam and whatnot. Uh, and they're spawning, uh, and they might even be successfully spawning. But, um, the thing about it is largemouth bass love channel catfish babies. And, and I mean, it's the, it's perfect food for them. Um, you know, a, they're, they're going to consume most of those catfish is, you know, if, if they're an inch long, two inches long, they hardly stand a chance. That's why when we stock catfish in our Iowa lakes, they have to be uh, seven, eight inches long, uh, and then they survive well. And, and so we stock those, and typically I think it's um, September uh, when they put those out there. So, um, yes, almost all of your catfish in our Iowa lakes are – uh, stock now, not on a raft, and not on a Sailorville, not on a, a, a Red Rock or a Corville, um, but but yeah, in uh, twelve mile, three mile Badger Creek, uh, you know, absolutely. Okay. Um. Do are we getting those fish locally? Because I know the hybrids are coming from out of state. The walleyes are in state. Do we yeah, get the catfish so, from here? So uh, we used to actually. Um, do our channel catfish from start to finish with Iowa fish. Uh, but now they actually get the fry or the larval fish, very tiny catfish from Missouri. Uh, and then we raise them from less than an inch all the way up to that eight inches. Um, that that's just a more efficient way for us to do it. Um, and, um, that frees up a lot of culture space for uh, our walleye and our hybrid striped bass and whatnot. So yeah, that's, that's the way they do it now. Okay, cool. So I'm a dumbass when it comes to fish raising and, and understanding I, I, I just got my own fish tank. I'm trying to make sure they stay alive. And I, I actually struggled <laughs> at the beginning. I'm not gonna, my daughters were like, dad, 
there were there were supposed to be four or five of them. Then next thing I know, there's only three. I'm like, oh shoot! And it's fresh water tank, by the way. So, wh- what do you guys actually do at the, the 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 fishery? Like, can you can you explain to like, a normal person that doesn't really understand what happens at at the hatchery and the, you know the fishery there? Like, how do you guys raise them and keep them all alive and you know healthy and all that stuff? I guess. I mean, is there special techniques or i mean what what do you guys normally do (laughs) you know there's some pretty amazing special techniques um you know i'm I'm not a hatchery biologist my office is at a fish hatchery but i do Mm -hmm. know a little bit about what they do and how they do it uh and i was a real leader literally a a national leader in uh, walleye culture Uh, we culture more walleyes i think than almost anybody these days so Mm -hmm. that's we produce more walleyes than just about ever any any state out there. Uh, to put it in perspective, this past spring on Rathbun Lake, we stocked somewhere around fifty-five million fry in Rathbun Lake. Wow! Um, that was a little higher than normal because we had some bonus extra fish uh, that uh, uh, made made their way into the lake. But that's okay because we've had a number of of uh, tough years for walleye production. Uh, and then in the fall, we will actually stock around 88,000 10 inch walleyes. Um, and um, those, those big walleyes, okay, those were actually made or, or uh, the, the, the methodology to prove to. Yeah. He's frozen. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh, 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 he was getting good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Yep. 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 Cool. Sorry. Uh, not sure what happened. Nope. No, you're, no worries. Worries. you're good. You're good. So where were we? We were talking about uh, stock walleyes. Yeah. 10 inch walleyes. Yeah. So they, yeah. these 10 inch, these 10 inch walleyes were, were developed, not this big. Um, <laughs> they, they, they were developed um, spe- specifically for Rathman Lake and to bring that walleye population back. And um, we have a, uh, a fish hatchery research staff at the Rathman Fish Hatchery, and they're kind of uh, um, not just uh, well known in the state or the Midwest, uh, but they're nationally and even internationally known for walleye culture. Um, so they uh, they've developed some amazing methods. Um, walleye production in Iowa is, is highly um, intensive. Uh, we you know we produce. I don't even remember how many. It was some amazing number of, of uh, eggs that we took on uh, took f- for the Rathbun Fish Hatchery this year. I want to say it was like 80 million plus. Um, and, um, you know, most of our walleyes are stocked as day old fry around the state, but some of them are held back at the fish hatchery. They're put in a one acre pond um, outside where they grow to be around an inch and a half long. Uh, from that point, they uh, can be stocked or a, a portion of those are actually held back. They're brought inside, put in a completely dark environment. Um, and the only light in, the, in that room uh, is a little flashlight bulb in each tank. And you know, you guys know walleyes. I mean, they, they don't like light. And um, so they have just enough light to know where the food is at. So a pellet, you know, these pellets will fall down into the water. Um, they eat this, this diet, this, this prepared diet. And um, in July, by July, they'll be about four or five inches long. Uh, at that point, they're moved back outside where they continue to um, eat a, eat this diet. And then come October, those fish are 10 inches long and they're stocked wrath and they're stocked uh, the Iowa Great Lakes. They're stocked at a host of lakes all over the state. Um, and that's something that really no one else was ever doing. There are other states doing that. There's federal agencies doing that. Um, but it's, it's basically Iowa's leading the, the way in that regard. So we've got some amazing uh, culture, some uh, really doing some great research and, and the, keeping Iowa on the forefront forefront of, of walleye production. So um, that's, that's, that's one thing that, you know, they do at the fish hatchery there. Um, you know, we grow muskies at Rathbun, channel catfish at Rathbun. They've got a pond of largemouth bass right now out there. 
uh, at times, if we have a lake renovation, you know, you, you, if you drain a lake, obviously you got to restock it. So uh, there'll be bluegill or red or sunfish or, uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, uh, without our fish hatcheries, you know, I, I, I know I said that's maybe not necessarily the most important thing we do, but without the fish hatcheries, we wouldn't have those fish and fishing in the United States. Okay. Hey, do, do, do any of our fish move out of state? Like, do we outsource them to surrounding states or anything? Yeah. So uh, occasionally, you know, I mentioned that we get uh, um, our catfish from Missouri. Well, occasionally, you know, there's kind of this fish trading network. And, and so sometimes if we have, for instance, maybe we have an excess number of, uh, uh, of uh, adult or uh, excess number of seven inch channel catfish, or maybe an excess number of uh, largemouth bass or, or, Occasionally, even states will, will have us uh, grow a few walleyes for them, and, and then we will trade uh, maybe high risk dry bass fry or, uh, um, um, you know, something to that end. Uh, I know that the federal fish hatchery at Genoa just sent us some smallmouth bass that were put, I don't know if it was Pleasant Creek or Lake McBride, but um, we, just, we just had that happen. Um, we had some walleyes come back out of, of the Genoa fish hatchery. So there's it's kind of this trading network of state and even federal agencies out there that, that do move fish around um, to kind of benefit everyone. Uh, our hybrid striped bass are coming from Kansas, Oklahoma, and, and other sources like that. And, and without those states helping us, we wouldn't know. Iowa walleyes have been transported all over the country. Uh, oh. They even, I think they did a, oh, and muskies, Iowa muskies too. Uh, on, in certain cases uh, where we, you know, there's only a certain number of muskies that we, we want to stock in our systems. And, and so occasionally there's been a few that have gone to Wisconsin. Um, they, uh, Wisconsin, they found out that uh, these Iowa muskies were like the main contributor to some of these big fisheries in there. And I was a little curious as to why the Iowa fish did so well. Oh, yeah, that's pretty dang cool. Yeah, it is. So if you're from Iowa and, uh, you know, uh, without us, uh, we don't we don't necessarily think of ourselves as uh, as a state that that has all these pristine resources. We've got some awesome resources, um, but we have a lot to offer and, and other states uh, recognize that. So we're, we're doing we're doing a good job, I guess, is what I would Right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, like, like normally the general public like would have no idea about any of this stuff. So it's a, that's pretty cool to learn. Like you guys have a network of fish tr trading. That's kind of no, that's really cool because like I don't think anybody even knew that, you know, how, how that works and how that happens. Uh, is there any um, I guess you say, is there any uh, obstacles that you would say that you guys run into as a fish biologist? Like, you know, that you wish the public knew that could help? you do your job better or help the whole system in a sense everyone that is from iowa recognizes and and maybe travels outside of iowa uh recognizes that we have some unique challenges in the state of iowa um you know i have kind of a side gig where i uh I teach for a community college uh, mm -hmm. and i teach environmental science courses and so I have a, a bit of a unique perspective because I, I study to teach. And um, one thing I've learned is Iowa is the most altered state in the country. No other state is more different today than it was pre-settlement. We have converted our land to 85% agriculture, essentially. Uh, and, and that, as a result, um, makes us face some challenges, like I said, that, that other states don't necessarily have. Um, and one of the biggest issues is our water quality issues, and whether that be um, you know, the two biggest water pollution issues, I guess, in, in my mind that we face are, are sediment and nutrients, whether it be nitrogen or phosphorus or both. So yeah, those are the two, those are the biggest challenges, the biggest hurdles that we face right now and the biggest hurdles that uh, we'll continue to fight. And uh, uh, as my daughter gets older, I hope she has to worry less about that sort of thing. Uh, mm. and, um, just so that uh, we, we get Iowa to a position where we have a, a strong economy, a strong agricultural um, um, industry. 
but yet we uh, recognize that uh, the land and the water uh, are our, our primary natural resources. And, and uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of a, I don't know, a paradigm, I guess, that we need to, we need to work on. We, we need to recognize that uh, in order to sustain agriculture, in order to sustain our environment, we have to find some better ways of, of doing what we do, um, both, uh, you know, and it isn't just agriculture, it's, it's uh, uh, construction, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, cities and the way we discharge stormwater, all those sorts of things um, are, are things that are, need to be and are being addressed on a wide scale. I had no idea. Uh, yeah, cheers. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. I'm getting, man, yeah. we're, hey, we're, we're getting a free education kit. <laughs> This episode was helped brought to you by our newest sponsor, Kelowna Brewing Company. They're a brewery out there in Eastern Iowa. So if you're in the area, make sure to stop by Kelowna and check out their brewery. Great food at the restaurant there, great beer, obviously. If you're in the Midwest, check out any Hy-Vee's. I believe they carry the six packs and they have different types of flavors. So you guys are gonna wanna you know, definitely try that out. And I think throughout this whole process, Fishing Kid and myself for Beer Fish Fanatics, we're gonna be doing some giveaways here and there. If you guys can go ahead and tag us here and there with your Kelowna beer. So other than that, enjoy the episode, guys. That's right. I think you can get like a three hour credit for this. Yeah, I know. See, <laughs> yeah, we can. Mark is a teacher. He just said it. He, you know, he's a professor at the, 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 the college. You know what I'm saying? So, yes. It's I will tell, <laughs> tell my wife, I went to school tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's what I love about doing these podcasts, like getting with getting together with individuals such as yourself that are, you know, more than just some random guy on YouTube or whatever, like people that are actually behind the scenes, basically making our fisheries what they are. Um, I feel like you guys go kind of underappreciated. That's why, you know, we like having guys such as yourself on here. We could, you know, at least, you know, put put this information out there. So I think it's I think it's awesome. So I appreciate the chance to talk about it and uh, uh, come on with you guys tonight. Well, let's let's talk about fishing. So, uh, what's I'm, I'm guessing you eat fish, right? I do eat fish um, um, a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, my my daughter was raiding the freezer last weekend, and she took uh, uh, she took the beef, she took the pork took uh some of the deer and i said well you want some of the fish and she says well i'd like to but my roommate's allergic to fish so having i'm not going to be having any beef pork or uh deer so i'm going to be eating a lot more of my fish but yeah i i do a lot of crappie fishing a lot of bluegill fishing i have had um, an outstanding year on walleyes this year on raft and it's probably been the best walleye year we've seen in a decade or more on raft wow um because uh even I'm catching them. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> you got to um, give yourself a little credit. Yeah. yeah. Well, I said, I said, I, I target hybrid striped bass. I would put myself in a category of a, a pretty decent hybrid striped bass angler, but a walleye angler, I, I, I enjoy it and I work at it, but uh, uh, this year has been really good. Um, and, and so, yeah, I've got a lot of walleyes put up this year and I, you know, my family's Northwest Iowa. We have, uh, we typically have a, a big family fish fry at least once a year. Hopefully post COVID we can, we can go back to that thing. And, and, uh, uh yeah, uh, the state fair, we've typically done some fish cleaning and cooking demonstrations each year. I'm excited that we're going to have a state fair again this year. We're going to be doing something like that again this year. So it's, it, you'd be amazed at the number of people who come through the fair and, and they say, oh, you can, you can, well, you know, for instance, I'll throw a, a, a sheephead, a freshwater drum out there on the, on the cleaning board, you know, and people can say, people will say, you can eat that? Well, I said, not only can you eat that, I'm going to clean it and I'm going to cook it for you right now and you're going to try it and you're going to think, wow, that's really good. And uh, it gives us kind of a unique opportunity to introduce some people to maybe some uh, you know, everyone knows a walleye's good. Everyone knows a bluegill's good. But let's show them some things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily know about. Like, you're gonna have to let us, or at least let me know when you're, because that's the favorite 
my, my kid's favorite spot to go to at the state fair to go to the Iowa DNR because they get yeah. to see all these holy cow those big fish dad how come you never catch those I'm like yeah I know <laughs> that's I, I would love to catch I, those monsters but I think it's the first Saturday of the state fair this year okay. typically we do two of them um but uh we've we've had some changes in the schedule because you know post COVID we're, we're kind of getting back into the swing of things with the state fair, but yeah, I think mm-hmm. it'll be, I think it's for Saturday, but yeah, get a hold of me. I'll let you know. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Like even like me as a grown person, I love going like, just, just going in there, just looking at the tanks. Cause uh, I just like looking at the fish and stuff. It's a pretty cool um, uh, venue there. Yeah. Pretty cool. Exhibit. Not to that- mention it doesn't cost a 14, doesn't cost $14 to eat it. Oh yeah. We, we even uh, silver carp, big head carp. We even show people how to clean those and cook and eat those. So wow. that's that's kind of something people have no clue about. Uh, but that's been, uh, you know, I've been dealing with the Asian carp invasion for a long time, my entire career. Uh, and the key is that we need to get people to understand that silver carp, the big head carp, you know, unfortunately they're here. We're going to try to find ways of minimizing their impacts. But they are something that can be eaten, uh, and and so that's one thing that we like to show people is there is a way of cleaning them, and they can be really delicious. Can you right. explain why they're so bad to our system? I know I know they're invasive, but I mean, can the reasoning behind? Well, I mean, there's the obvious with the silver carp that you know you get a sixty pound fish jumping out of the water, and you get hit in the face with that when you're you're uh, water skiing. Obviously, that's that's going to be a bad one. And eventually, <laughs> eventually someone's going to get seriously hurt with that. But the other, the, the more important thing is, uh, or at least, uh, you know, that from an environmental perspective, the, the more important thing is that they are a massive plank to board that outcompete. Um, basically, they're eating plank. Even though it's a 112 pound big head cart, they're eating plank in their entire life. That plankton is important to drive the whole food chain, the whole food web of everything. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of a fish you are. If you're a baby fish, you need plankton to eat. And if that's all being consumed by uh, the, the big heads and the silvers, uh, then, we got, then we have a problem. Uh, so they're tying up massive amounts of biomass. Um, you know, for instance, the Illinois River, they, they've done some estimates and, you know, 95 plus percent of all the fish in the system or in, in certain reaches of that system are, are uh, big head or silver carp. Um, we see massive numbers of them um, in the Des Moines River. Uh, they've been in the Sheridan River. The, the big head carp have been in the Sheridan River. we documented since 1996. Um you know, and uh, the first silver carp we discovered at Kiyosakwa in, I remember what year it was. It might have been 2008. I can't recall. We caught it uh, when we were out electrofishing. Um, but, um, you know, we've watched their populations expand. We even saw reproduction of big head carp, silver carp, and grass carp, all three of them. Um, below Lake Rathbun here a couple of years back. So uh, the populations, populations continue ex- to expand. There's a lot of research going in, again, trying to find ways of minimizing their impacts, reducing their numbers. Just spoke to a, a guy with the um, U.S. Geological Survey today who's wanting to do a project on, on grass carp reductions. Um, and uh, so we'll be working with him on a project here. So, yeah, it's... It, they are a problem because they basically eat everything that everybody else needs. Mm. And they're, they're, then they're competing directly with some of our important species like uh, paddlefish, um, buffalo. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a huge change and, and uh, huge uh, unwanted introduction. Would you say that's like the like the number one invasive species that has like made a, a huge impact? Uh, you know, that's a huge one. Um, the zebra and quagga mussel issue Ooh, is a is a yeah. huge one, obviously. Um, 
you know, the zebra mussels moved from the, from the, the Great Lakes, you know, the, the big freshwater Great Lakes um, into the Mississippi River system. And they moved from the northern part of Iowa to the southern part of Iowa within a year once that expansion started. But now we're starting to see them expanding into some of our lake systems. Uh, you know, we've got we've had them in Clear Lake for a number of years. Um, I believe, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that they are in Storm Lake now, but don't quote me necessarily on that. Um, we we know that they're in Rathen Lake to some degree. Uh, we've never collected an adult, but we do see larval ones out there. So if there's larval, one, larval ones, there has to be an adult somewhere. Uh, mm. So same deal. They eat plankton. Mm. And so you have the Asian carp, you have the, the, the zebra mussels all actually competing for that plankton diet and uh, upsetting the food web for everything up above it. Uh, and, and it's a... You know, there's all kinds of invasive species out there, but those I think are probably the two most well-known and the most damaging ones right here in Iowa. Mm, okay, yeah, like we were down in Kansas, the the lake that we were at, they they have zebra mussels down there too, and like I think the water was uh, up up higher maybe like last year or something, but there's shells like everywhere, yeah. these tiny little mussel shells everywhere over there. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the first lakes in Kansas to get infested with El Dorado Reservoir, uh, and they dropped the water level there, and the entire lake bottom was just covered in, in zebra mussels. Uh, so it's it, it's definitely something to behold, and uh, definitely you know it's a pretty sad statement on on what's happened to some of these systems. Hopefully, we can all help to change that. We definitely want to do everything we can to not spread them. Yeah. That's for sure. So what's, uh, what are some uh, measures that like us as anglers can take to prevent spreading invasive species? Well, you know, there's, uh, there's some laws that you're supposed to follow. And, and uh, so, you know, just to kind of hit the highlights with that, you know, you're not going to be transporting water in your live well anymore. When you leave a lake um, and you've caught some fish, and you want to take them home and clean them, you, you need to drain your life well. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to put those fish on ice and, and you're not going to be transporting water from that lake. Um, pull the plug on your boat, uh, drain the water out of the bilge um, because you don't want to transport that water to the next lake because the water that's in your boat right now could be contaminated. Typically, um, you know, you, if, um, if you're not going to be fishing for five days or so, you know, that boat will have a chance to dry out and, and you shouldn't be, trans you, you shouldn't, uh, you should be safe. You, you probably won't be transporting larval zebra mussels because you can't see them. They're microscopic. Mm. Uh, but, uh, um, you, you, you know, if you're letting that boat dry, um, before you go to the next lake, um, you're, you're, you're probably going to be safe. Um, that being said, uh, if you're going to be going from one lake to another, it's a good idea to stop at car wash and using heated wa heated water is a is a good way of, of uh, uh, killing out killing off those fish or fish those uh, those zebra mussels. A um, couple of things along that line: vegetation. There's all kinds of invasive species of vegetation, so make sure you're not transporting vegetation on your boat trailer. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing anymore is treating vegetation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you go to a lake and it's choked with curly leaf pondweed in the early part of the year. And, and that's an invasive species. But there's others out there. Eurasian water milfoil. There is a uh, um, um, brill naiad. These are all problem species that we spend a lot of effort and money fighting. Uh, it's changed the way our fish hatcheries have to do things, too, because, you know, I mentioned that Rathbun is considered an infested lake with zebra mussels because we we do have a few larvae floating around out there. Um, and so the any fish that's transported from the Rathbun fish hatchery has to go through a treatment process uh, before it can be stocked in a, in, a, in a lake elsewhere. So we have to make sure we, there's certain uh, chemicals that they utilize to... Uh, kill off those larval zebra mussels before that water is is transported to another lake. So, you know, 
it isn't just the general public that has to follow these rules. It's it's us as well. You know, we're we're following the same protocols and uh, uh, and more uh, to protect our our lakes and and stop the spread of these invasive species. I would assume same with kayakers too, because we ki- we we kayak fish a lot, and I don't know whether you know other kayak fishermen think you know whatever they may think or not, but we're in the same boat. You can carry this yeah. stuff. You know, Fun intended, right? Yeah. So uh, the the thing is that um, anytime you you can transport water, you, you have the potential to be transporting, uh, yeah. you know, zebra mussels, um, you know, and, and uh, vegetation as well. Just make sure everything's nice and clean. Oh, makes sense. <clears throat> um, my my wife had a question because you know she was just wondering because she read stuff. So eating fish, freshwater fish, I mean, how too much of it, there's mercury or whatnot. She's just concerned. Is there, is there, uh, you know, when people eating fish, should they be concerned about too much mercury intake and all that? Or, or is it a, a real thing? There, there are some fish advisories out there in terms of um, what, uh, what you, what you should be eating. Okay. Um, mercury is a concern. Merc- mercury is a naturally occurring element obviously but uh, uh it's concentrations uh bio magnifier bio amplify so it's at a very low level low down on the food chain but the farther up you get in other words the as you go from uh a, you know from vegetation to plankton to small fish to uh, uh bluegills to crappies to largemouth bass to you know, these top level predators like walleye, large not bass muskies, the higher you go up in the food chain, the higher the potential for those concentrations. To be. Um, mercury uh, is, a, is, is an interesting element. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit different than, than some of the other things we've had consumption advisories on. For instance, chlordane was, uh, was a pesticide that was utilized. So that man was actually applying chlordane. We don't have a lot of that issue anymore because chlordane was essentially outlawed back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has like a 12-year half-life. But the long and the short of it is we're doing a, a big statewide study on mercury concentration. Um, and there'll be some uh, some new recommendations on consumption of a host of spe- fish species, uh, whether it be flathead catfish, largemouth bass, crappies, bluegill, walleyes. There's going to be a whole suite of recommendations out there on what you should be eating. Now, why is mercury an issue? Um, mercury is an issue because, you know, for the three of us, it's not a big issue because uh, we're neither a child, well, some people might claim I'm a child, but uh, <laughs> same, same, same. <laughs> we're not a child and we're not a woman of childbearing age. Uh, and those are the, the, the big target groups. And the reason being that uh, mercury, when it finds its way into your body, it impacts the development of a nervous system, of the, of the, of the nervous, of a developing nervous system. You and I, our nervous systems are as developed as they're going to get, but a child uh, that you know, as they grow, their, their nervous system nervous system is developing, and so they can negatively impact that process. Uh, our our mercury levels um, have we you know we have found mercury in, in some of our species. Um, not even some of the species I would have thought had the potential, though. Uh, for instance, we just tested a bunch of shovel nose sturgeon last year out of the Des Moines River, and and almost no mercury to speak of. So. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of really good information coming out about that. What I would tell people is fish is fish are wholesome. Mm-hmm. Fish are nutritious. Many fish species are high in omega-3 fatty acids, which uh, are antioxidants and very important and, and very good for your diet. Uh, so fish is a, a very viable, a very good part uh, or very good food to consume. Um the consumption advisories <clears throat> are set so there is a whole, a huge buffer zone for safety. Mm. Um, so, you know, whatever, whatever these advisories may say, may, for instance, it may say eat one, you know, if you're a person of this age and, and you're a female, maybe it might say eat, eat uh, you know, one 
eight ounce portion of largemouth bass a week or something like that. And I'm making all this up. So mm-hmm. this isn't, that is going to be an extremely safe consumption level. Okay. Um, you know, you, you would have to be eating much, much higher concentration. Uh, and, and that's just the way that consumption advisories are, are done. You know, I, I work with some uh, uh, different pesticides uh, in the fisheries world, and, and we know that uh, um, the, these advisories or these consumption levels are set so that there's a huge buffer, a huge protection layer, I guess you would say. So uh, mm-hmm. to keep everyone safe. Moderation. Moderation, moderation, moderation. <laughs> common sense. Here we go again, Kit. <laughs> yeah, common sense ain't so common sometimes. Yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> don't don't eat fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you'll be just fine, technically. Yeah, right. Well, it's, it's uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty warm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've been. This is so awesome. This is so much like amazing information that you know. You, I, I hope we we get an opportunity to get you back on, Mark, because this is like really to me is priceless information to for our listeners for ourselves because we're we're i'm just absorbing man is well, i don't want to i hope i haven't bored anybody but yeah it's it's fun to talk about this damn stuff no, I mean, oh, it ain't it ain't boring at all like, i love this stuff especially yeah. all this like just I don't, i'm a fishing geek so <laughs> i love this stuff <laughs> uh so you got anything else for mark though kid i mean i know it's getting a little bit late but i just want to make sure because we 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 will be able to get you back on because i really i i think you have a lot to to bring to our audience and to us you know in regards to your knowledge base and everything if we can get you back on it'd be amazing but um you got anything else for him kid uh yeah so like i mean if if you're up for it you know if our audience wants to reach out to you or look up the articles that you've uh, written, where can they find this, all this information? Well, um, my office is at the Rathman Fish Hatchery. <clears throat> and so you can always contact me there. Um, you know, uh, if you go to iowadnr.gov, there's a host of information on uh, everything fish, fishing, and, and wildlife related at iowadnr.gov. You know, another thing we didn't talk about is I do a lot of farm pond management seminars and give a lot of advice on that on an annual basis. And that is probably the most often questioned. Uh, the, the, the Most of the phone calls I get over the course of a year are about farm ponds. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always invite people to contact me at the Rath and Fish Hatchery and I'll, I'll you know, give them my best advice on farm pond management. Um, you know, that's, I do farm pond management seminars at the state fair. Every year. So, uh, yeah, get a hold of me. Um, if I don't have an answer for a question, I will find somebody. To do it. Perfect. And we'll, we'll make sure to put the links of everything like you just said and links how to get a hold of you in the IODNR and everything. And you know what? We didn't get to that because that means you have to come back on. Yeah, you'll have to be back. <laughs> you'll have to be back and really explain to us about the, the farm pond because now you got my mind intrigued. I want to learn a lot about that. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody's going to want to know a little bit more. At least our, our Iowa listeners are going to want to know about the farm ponds and and, and what what you have to to be able to teach them a little bit about that. 90,000 farm ponds in the state of Iowa. Wow. So, wow. And uh, something like, I don't know, it's, it's just short of 20% of us, uh, you know, prefer fish farm ponds over everything else. And most mm. of us get their first fish out of a farm pond. So, yeah, there's it's a very important resource to it. All right, there you go. So our listeners are going to have to follow us. And then uh, once we get our schedules online again, Mark, we'll definitely have to get you back on so we can ask you that and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but other than that, I, I, I really do appreciate your time, uh, your knowledge, your effort, and everything that y- you're giving to us because, I mean, like I said, it's really priceless information. And um, to us fishermen, whether novice, whether experts, or whether you just, you know, it, it doesn't even matter. I think uh, the information you brought today and to us uh, will help us become better number one and then become better environmentalists and 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 just better anglers period so um other than that man thank you so much mark i appreciate it sir thanks guys yeah yeah great weekend you too you too